To all of our viewers, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it is the second panel of CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, for those who are unfamiliar. Um, it's uh, the second panel in our discussion series on COVID-19 and food security. So this panel focuses on challenges and solutions uh, to input supply chains and on the form realities. So we launched this online discussion series to bring emergent research and on the ground realities together in conversation in order to map out the direct impacts of COVID-19 across food chains and glean uh, data-driven recommendations and solutions. So uh, please welcome, uh, we have here Richard Cholotan. He's the Director of Agriculture and Economic Growth um, Sector at TetraTech. Uh, we have Chiamaka Unduku. She's a founder and CEO of the agri-tech company AgroHive. Uh, Susan Matthew, an agricultural trade analyst and Berber Kramer, research fellow with the International Food Policy Research Institute. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to uh, talk about some recommendations on how to best engage with this, with this platform. Uh, so, we, after each of the panels present, panelists present, we will have a uh, short uh, Q&A from the audience. So, please feel free to send your questions through beforehand as well. At any time is fine. You can direct them towards all panelists or just to a, a, a one panelist in particular. Um, and we'll try to get to all of these questions uh, as well as we can. Um, then once all the panelists have presented, we will open up again for cross discussion between panelists, but also for um, any viewers too. So I'm going to hold up this little q and I know it probably looks a little bit backwards, but for, you know, just to remind you to send any questions through if you have them. Um, also feel free to engage with the poll and, um, we also have a, uh, a spreadsheet that we're going to post a link to towards the end of this, of this discussion. And basically, it will just be a way to connect with others who are uh, viewing this discussion. So you can share your name, your company, and any solutions or challenges that you found in your own experience um, you know, combating these different COVID impacts and you can offer uh, help or you can ask for help as well. So we'll be posting that, that shortly. Um, so before we start, I thought it could be a great idea for all of us panelists to take a nice selfie <laughs> so that we can post it on, um, on our social media channels uh, later on in the day. So I'm gonna count to three so you can put your best smiles forward or you know whatever you wanna do. All right, so okay, ready, one, two and three <laughs> okay thank you all right okay so let's get started so we're going to start today with richard um as i said earlier he's the director of agriculture and economic growth at tetra tech uh, international development services he is a recognized expert in food security agricultural technology climate change adaptation, risk finance, resilience, emergency preparedness, and early warning. Um, as a former chief of the World Food Program's Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction Unit, he is a recognized expert in climate change adaptation and risk mitigation, resilience, food security, uh, emergency preparedness, and early warning systems. So um, please, Richard, uh, you're welcome to take the floor. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone. Great, great to be here with everyone th this morning or, or, or this afternoon, depending on, on, on where you are. I'm gonna put up a few, few slides here to see if I can uh, share those. Uh, let me know if you, if you can see those. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can see the slide, please. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm going to rush uh, through this. We've got five minutes to present and then five minutes to, to, to discuss and I, I don't want to eat into the discussion time. So, so let me just start by saying I want to talk about three things. One, one is a survey um, that we conducted um, uh, at the onset of the COVID uh, pandemic and I'll explain that a little bit and then I'll talk about um, kind of how that links to our work on crop analytics and, and trying to get a more um, robust picture of what's happening in agriculture and food security because of COVID. 
Um, and then I'll try and touch on some of the lessons from this um, this process. So, so when the when the pandemic first started, we we were obviously like like everyone here, really concerned about what was was happening. Um, and through a range of different projects and partnerships, we're we're working on um, crop analytics and digital supply chains and digital farmer um, solutions. And so we we tried to put together a, a partnership. Uh, to try and use those digital supply chains and, and crop analytics tools to figure out what was what was happening. And so the first thing we did was put together a partnership, um, principally with the Africa Fertilizer and Agribusiness Partnership and, and Six Grain, a crop analytics firm, and, and, and some others, including uh, a range of, of partners that you see on, on the screen. Um, and we rapidly tried to mobilize a survey across 10 countries in, in Africa to just try and figure out what, what was, was going on. Uh, we were able to survey over 450 farmers and, and 60 wholesale agro dealers uh, at the end of April and um, uh, beginning of, of, of May. And, and I just wanna flag some of the key findings from that that, that, that emerged um, and, and go from, from there. So first, um, we found really early on that farmers were already uh, in those 10 African countries uh, reporting negative impacts on their food security and their production. Uh, they were reporting impacts to, to harvesting, uh, lack of labor, lack of uh, supply and higher prices for inputs. Uh, they reported market impacts, traders and middlemen not as active, um, transport to markets disrupted and more expensive and, and markets closed. Um, so all, all the things that we kind of feared were, were happening, we, we confirmed were, were happening. We also found things like farmers were reporting holding more of their own production at the household level to meet their own needs. Uh, and that some were trying to implement uh, COVID control measures at the farm level with their families and, and laborers, although they didn't really know exactly um, what to do. And of course, holding more food at the household level has, has upstream market impacts as, as well. You can see here in this, this one, one graph, over half of the farmers that we surveyed reported selling less into, uh, into markets to protect their own, own food security. Um, when we talked to, to agro dealers, uh, they also reported negative impacts, but differ, a different level. Um, they reported impacts to their ability to source uh, inputs to, to sell on to, to retailers, um, uh, their access to, to farmers and retailers was, was curtailed, farmers couldn't travel to retail stores, uh, some of those stores were closed, um, transport uh, for seeds and input delivery was, was restricted and more expensive and, and they themselves faced labor shortages. They reported the seeds and inputs were less available and, and more expensive. And so in a place that's uh, either about to start uh, an ag production season or, or in the middle of it, that's a pretty, um, pretty significant finding. One thing we also found that, that I, I guess didn't surprise us, but we thought was really significant is agro-dealers reported uh, reduced access to trade uh, credit uh, and uh, bank credit and uh, less favorable uh, terms, higher interest rates, uh, shorter repayment rates. And so just at the time where the uh, finance system for ag inputs needed to be more flexible, it was becoming less, less flexible, which is kind of, an, I think, an important policy, policy finding. Uh, there's lots more we, we found. I'm happy to share the, the full findings of our, our, our survey, but those are some of the uh, initial initial things that that I wanted to, to highlight um, when we started this our uh, our plan uh, was and, and and still is to combine that kind of um, data collection through digital supply chains and digitally connected uh, farmers with crop analytics that look for primarily four things changes in area planted so can we see uh, where farmers are, are planting less area because of uh, restrictions in access to seed or, or, or labor or other things. Can we see them switching crop types? Uh, can we see what's happening with harvests or harvest staying in the fields because people can't access labor or, or, or machinery to harvest? And, and can we detect yield 
um, changes. And so we're currently working with a number of different partners to try and try and do that uh, now on a more ongoing um, basis. And we also really felt like putting that kind of crop analytics in context was important. So trying to overlay what's happening uh, at the farm level with COVID control measures and epidemiological projections. So where will harvest periods overlap with peak periods in, uh, in, in COVID infections, uh, link it with market data like like border closures so for example the, clo the closure of the border between tanzania and zambia has pretty significant trade implications across east, east africa uh, food security conditions where there are already high levels of food insecurity these disruptions are obviously more more significant and if we have time i, I have an example to show of that um, and then how does how does covid um, uh, overlay with other hazards like drought or, or conflict that are still going on um, and how does it overlay with seasonal calendars so just just let me wrap up um, with some some lessons that we're still learning I, I wouldn't say lessons learned here because this is very much an, an iterative uh, process so we found that you know you trying to use this network of, of digitally connected farmers and market systems actors that that we and our, our partners had was a great opportunity to quickly kind of assess the systemic shock that COVID represented over a large area in multiple countries. But we found it's not as easy as we hoped. The systems were not designed to do this kind of assessment. Um, and so although there was a lot of willingness trying to figure out the mechanics of how to do it ended up being difficult to the point where our first round of data collection was done in Word uh, because our partners couldn't quite figure out how to get it into their digital tools quick enough. Um, and so if we think about how we might do this in the future, thinking through um, how we might have a more adaptable dynamic set of tools to collect that data integrated into existing systems is, is an interesting thought. Um, a lot of times I think we focus on household level and on farm uh, impacts, but I think the uh, findings we found from, from asking wholesale agri-dealers what was going on and what they were finding was, was really important, especially in terms of informing policy, uh, policy options to, to address um, the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and then context and timing are everything. So really thinking about, you know, why findings are happening in the, in the seasonal calendar context in terms of where the COVID pandemic is and control measures are is, is, is really important and, and, not, and not easy. Um, and then this issue of, of compound risk we also found w was important. So in places that are currently facing high levels of food insecurity or food crises, even minor disruptions can kind of push them further, further into crisis or, or over the edge in, into crisis. And, and so trying to just interpret crop analytics by them by themselves isn't isn't enough um, and then policy responses have an important impact and we saw that even earlier on so you'll see in the chat box i put our su surprising finding is we, we got about 10 percent of the farmers that we surveyed saying like they had minor or significant positive impacts and we couldn't understand why why were we seeing positive impacts from uh from covid 19 and what we found uh, was that in Zimbabwe and Angola there were no cues for fuel so farmers were much uh, more easily able to get get fuel uh, agriculture was deemed an essential service so they could get to input suppliers um, more easily than than normal um, labor was cheaper for larger farmers because people weren't doing anything a lot of households um, also found that because um, retail markets were closed a lot of the community was coming to the farm gate to buy food so they were getting a lot more direct sales of food so you know trying to understand some of those dynamics and how to take advantage of the opportunities to to support uh, farmers uh, during those uh, times is um, is really important so I'll, I'll stop there i think that was my five five minutes um and uh, look forward to the discussion thank you so much Thank you so much, Richard. Um, 
So I have a quick question here actually from one of our panelists. So Berber was interested to know whether farmers also experienced more restrictions in accessing credits or did access to credit deteriorate only for your wholesaler sample? Um, so we, we found that um, farmers' access to inputs declined uh, and that they were more expensive. Uh, we didn't get any reports of credit access at the farm level um, changing initially, and I think that's because the, you know, the, the seasons were set, so, so dealers had their credit packages in place or, or farmers had their credit arrangements in place when it hit, um, and so they didn't, didn't quite see that. Um, but we didn't, the, the, the survey for us raised way more questions than we were able to answer. So I think there's a whole series of follow-up about, you know, what, what happened there and, and, and how, how, to de how to deal with those issues. So that's a great question. Um, so I have another question from John Agwola. Uh, he asks, what are the major impediments experienced um, by farmers in, with digital tools, I guess, and in which area of the value chain are digital tools more, more adoptable? Well, that's a big question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a whole issue about which farmers have access to digital tools, and that was definitely a shortcoming in our survey that most of the networks that we used were more commercial um, networks where uh, farmers were, were medium or larger farmers with access to those digital tools. Um, we did uh, we did manage to get uh, our partners like like Syngenta to get their retail agents or extension agents to also collect data from uh, smallholders in a more you know, traditional method, um, and that was that was useful. Um, I, I would say you know like the there's a huge potential um, to use. Um, digital agriculture tools to to help farmers be more flexible to kind of manage the supply chain disruptions, particularly on the input side and and the retail side more more effectively. So we we, we found kind of the the traditional methods of of uh, retail input supply were were disrupted because of transport, prin principally because transport was disrupted, both to the retail agents and then to to farmers. And and I think that you know, the, the more that we're able to streamline those processes and provide more flexible ways to get inputs out to farmers, um, the better. Um, I, I also think, you know, this was an interesting exercise in, in kind of two-way communication because um, you saw examples in our, uh, in our survey, like, like Angola and Zimbabwe, where they'd made policy decisions about how to treat agriculture in, in the lockdown that enabled farmers easier access to input supply. And so trying to find ways to get this two-way communication uh, up and down the chain from farmers to policymakers to inform that policy process uh, is, is really important. And, and I think di digital, digitally connected farmers who, who have an easier way to, to provide their input and needs and, and impacts back into the policy making process is, is really a potential benefit. Thanks. Um, so I have uh, w one more question, a bit of a combined question here. So um, from Tadesi, she asks, um, or he, she, sorry, asks, <laughs> how could this impact uh, the productivity of most production? Sorry, how could um, the fact that inputs for agriculture production, how they're, they're being imported mostly from the developing world. So how could this impact the productivity of most production set sectors? and which agricultural systems are more, more vulnerable. And I just want to tack on to that and say, like, how do you think this technology could be used for building resilient food systems in the long term? Wow, that's a tough question and a big one uh, too. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in, in some ways, and, and this is not unique to agriculture, the systemic disruption of COVID has shown how um, centralized global supply chains are easily disrupted um, and I think that's especially the case for smallholder farmers living in countries that don't have 
um, very diverse uh, input markets. Um, and so what, what we found is, you, you know, those, those kind of upstream um, disruptions, so the, the fact that wholesalers were not able to get um, seeds and inputs, that prices for wholesalers went up, and then that translated down into retailers, that those that stayed open, and then onto, onto farmers. Um, that's just a systemic vulnerability of our, our system at the moment. So I think we really need to think through what, what does it mean for, for us to have a, you know, an ag and, and food system, and in this case, an input supply system that is more, more flexible and adaptable, uh, more decentralized. Um, and adaptability means as, as much um, able to adjust um, to shocks that you don't anticipate. So digitally connected um, supply chains and, and farmers can, can allow us to adapt faster uh, if we build that into our thinking as we, as we develop them. Um, and they can also be ways to help farmers um, uh, shift their practices when their, their regular inputs are not available. So maybe, maybe farmers could um, try a, a different uh, a different way of conservation agriculture that they might not ordinarily uh, try in a circumstance like this because they can't get access to the inputs they would normally use. And if they are connected digitally, that's a lot, uh, there's a lot easier way to get them extension advice, planting advice, um, alternative crop protocols and, and, and things like that that would help them adapt and cope with the situation a, a bit better. So. Uh, the, the more we can think through how to how to really support smallholders, get them the information that they need to be able to adapt as those disruptions occur, the, the better. And then at a policy level, the more we can think through um, how vulnerable our kind of centralized global supply chains are and how to make them more, more local, um, more adaptable and, and, and more interconnected at the local level, I think the, the better. Thank, thank you so much, Richard. Um, we still have a few questions there that are unanswered at the moment, but we will have an additional Q&A at the end once all panelists have finished presenting. So just hold, hold on for that, please. Um, so the next speaker today um, we have is uh, Chiamako Nduku. So she is the founder and CEO of AgroHive. It's a Nigerian agri-tech company that provides agricultural businesses and farmers with appropriately trained agricultural workforce that meets their labor and skills need. She's an advocate for sustainable agriculture and is passionate about leveraging technology in tackling the un alarming unemployment and food security crisis in Africa. So uh, Chivaka, if you want to just uh, take it away again, everybody just please, uh, uh, it's great that you're putting your questions into the chat, but also please remember to put them into the Q&A option at the, at the bottom of the screen to be sure that we that they get the attention deserved. Okay, thank you so much, Chiamaka. You can you can take it away. Uh, thank you, Marian. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for having me on this beautiful platform to discuss uh, the challenges that uh, COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis has presented. Um, today I'll be talking about the benefits of training and upskilling smallholder farmers, uh, especially women, on the use of digital tools for sustainable food production. Um, for today, uh, sorry, Maureen, can you help me share my screen? My slides, sorry. Yes, absolutely, no problem. One moment. Okay. 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 So I, I, I would be focusing on uh, the need to upskill smallholder farmers on the use of simple digital tools to, uh, to collect data and also analyze it, and which will definitely increase food production and their profits as well. So um, I'm waiting for Mary. Yes, yeah, so sorry, one moment, one moment, okay. 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 So uh, while I wait for her, I'll be talking about the problem smallholder farmers, especially smallholder farmers in Nigeria face. Um, I'll also be talking about how the COVID-19 crisis has greatly affected smallholder farmers, um, the possible solutions, 
and uh, the results uh, of past trials AgroHive has implemented, the, the project, the training projects we've implemented in the past and the results and so far and how it has impacted the lives of smallholder farmers. Um, so are we ready? I'm, I'm very sorry about this, but uh, unfortunately there's a little bit of a glitch. I can't uh, share the, the presentation without restarting Zoom. I'm, I'm very sorry about that, but um, I will send this to all of the viewers um, after, uh, the, pre after the, the panel of the session is over. Uh, I'm very okay. sorry again. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can come up with, a, with another solution. Um, but you wanna, I'll, you wanna send it to me and I'll share my screen? Yes, Richard, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Great pleasure. Okay, so while we wait, probably I'll just go on with the conversation. Um, currently in Nigeria, uh, the smallholder farmers who are uh, the producers of 80%, over 80% of the food consumed in Nigeria have a big issue, which is the lack of skills and the knowledge that will help them make um, wise investment decisions, agribusiness investment decisions. Often at times, uh, most smallholder farmers in Nigeria, unfortunately, unfortunately do not have um, do not have data that, it, that can help them make decisions for their nest farming. And most of them also do not have the information on uh, existing digital platforms that can help them sell their products effectively. Uh, so um, this, this problem got so serious during the, the crisis here in Nigeria as most major farmers in Nigeria had to depend solely on digital tools to be able to sell their products or to be able to make investment decisions for their next um, agribusinesses. So uh, at AgroHive, we discovered that 80% of farmers who were not able to use these digital tools for data entry uh, were, uh, were actually affected and they couldn't even um, raise money for their nest planting, they couldn't raise money, they, sh they couldn't get financial assistance because they didn't have data and records to, to go for um, the uh, small grants that are available in the country. And um, I believe that with digital schools, with of training farmers on the use of digital tools, uh, they, they, they can be able to, to make good investment decisions, they can be able to, um, get funding and they can also be able to sell their products effectively. So um, one of the things we did at AgroHive was uh, to start uh, an upskilling training for key agricultural players in the country. We, we, discuss, we taught it twice to train them on the use of basic digital schools like, tools like um, the use of Excel uh, to, 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 to uh, manage the data they've collected, we also taught them how to use for, for female for rural women farmers in communities who do not need uh, to use the Excel. We taught them how to um, do simple uh, farm management farm management um, processes, and we also taught them how to collect data using simple tools like record books, um, um, softwares like AgriV and ProBT. And also, we also taught most of them who had uh, poultry farms and couldn't manage the temperature and everything about handling a poultry farm, the simple use of uh, thermometers to collect information and also how to transfer this information, this data they've, got, they've gotten to a, a digital tool that can help them see the results, the, the results of the data collected and how they can be able to use it to make further decisions. Um, so far, we, we discovered, well, after the training, um, the tra first training for women, we discovered that most of them were able to navigate through a lot of issues in, in running their farms. Most of them discovered that all along they've been scaling on losses because they didn't even have the right information to know that 
okay, they are making a, a mistake uh, or they are not getting, making profits. And uh, for the young people who were able to attend our classes, our upskilling training on the use of simple digital tools for, for, for average business productivity, they've been able to, you know, start up simple um, digital um, tool. Uh, they've been able to, sorry, they've been able to collect simple data for, for their productivity and for their farm management. And for those that were able to learn how to use these tools for sales and marketing, they've recorded increase in sales and uh, the results has been really, really great. And one of the beautiful things that we discovered while um, doing the training, before we did the training was uh, when we sent out a needs assessment form to be filled, to be filled, when we sent out a needs assessment form to be filled, we discovered that 80% of those that filled the form were actually agricultural, they were learned. And unfortunately in Africa, most of our higher institutions, they don't train us on the use of um, these tools to grow their businesses. And most of them shared, shared their experiences. Uh, and we're really grateful that they were able to use these simple tools to enhance productivity. Uh, we also discovered that aside um, being uh, graduates, a good number of them, about 20% of those that registered, they were really interested in going to agribusiness. And the problem they always encountered is, that, is the problem of not being able to use, to, to, on the, to manage farms. Most of them have the problem of not being able to even uh, do, write a simple feasibility studies because they don't even have data that they can refer to to run a farm. So one of the problems we are trying to solve in Nigeria is to train um, agricultural, agricultural professionals and agribusinesses on the use of simple tools that can help them collect data, analyze it, and also use it to make wise agribusiness decisions that would help increase productivity, and more importantly, their standard of living. That's wonderful, Chemaka, that's wonderful. There's, uh, I mean, we can talk so much about big data and digital tools, but if that component of training is not there, you know, bringing all that technology directly to the farmers, you know, it's, there's, what's the, what's the point of it? So that is just such an important function, especially when you're talking about uh, bridging that, uh, that, that gap, you know, between the genders of, you know, women having access to technology and also having that literacy. So that's, that's really uh, important work. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how this pandemic has impacted uh, your ability to provide this training? And if there's anything as well that, that you have, that you have seen any changes um, since this since this global pandemic? Okay, thank you, Marianne. Okay, so um, before the pandemic, AgroHive uh, carried out its training in farms. We we had to go to the rural communities. We had to go to the youth. We had to go to the rural women in villages to to train them. But uh, when the pandemic struck, we couldn't even conduct our trainings. In fact, we had trainings that were just um, not, that were halted because there were no means of getting these classes to the rural women. So what we did was to think of ways we can interact with them, think of ways we can interact with agribusiness owners and youths. And we discovered that there is a platform, a simple platform that will enable us to effectively train them. And that platform is the <coughs> Google Classroom. So we decided to use a digital platform, Google Classroom, to, to train youths. And we, we had over 445 youths apply. Uh, most of them are currently on the classroom learning as we speak. And it's been a very wonderful experience because despite the COVID-19 pandemic, so people were still able to get knowledge. People were still able to learn. Um, so far, for those that already have the agribusinesses who are already implementing the, uh, the trainings, the skills learned from the AgroSkill Up 2.0 virtual training, they've been sharing wonderful testimonies. And 
most of the graduates who attended the training, they, they were shocked and kept on sending good feedbacks on how they didn't know these tools existed and how they didn't know that with these tools, they can even simplify the process of farm management, sales and marketing for their businesses. And the testimonies really have shown that with or without a crisis, uh, we can still impact knowledge, you can still upskill people. That's great. I, I have a few questions coming in here. Uh, first of them, first, the first <laughs> questions from John and Agbula, who's actually one of our youth and data uh, ambassadors, um, and from Nigeria as well. So uh, he has a question. He wants to know, how do you verify the authenticity of the data submitted by farmers or agribusiness players? In addition, do you help in data interpretation for small holder farmers? How do you do that? and whether you analyze and evaluate the impact of the training on these soft digital tools. Okay, thank you, John. So uh, for the data, for the data, you asked if, you asked how we, we analyze the data and um, how do we validate the authenticity of the data. So um, the, the data is collected. We, we started with training on the use of simple tools like Excel. So what we taught the farmers to do is to is to first use a record book, especially for the rural farmers. We told them to use a record book to write down every information, every input they get, the number of inputs they get, the yield, the information they've gotten, and then it is transferred for those that are learned and can have, uh, that can use this um, digital tools like the younger ones, they can now transfer this data to um, digital platforms like Excel or AgriV, and automatically the, 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 the platform, the digital tool automatically generates the information and analysis needed. Then for the rural women who really can't use these tools, uh, AgriHive uh, sources young people, graduates who are learned and who knows how to use these simple tools to assist these women, these women in collecting data and analyzing it. So the, all they have to do is to ensure that they have a notebook to write down this information. That's for the aged women who are into farming. They have a notebook to write it down and an agrohive agent is attached to them to ensure that this data is properly stored and analyzed. So that, that, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> I think that that also um, uh, helps to begin to answer one of the other questions. We're going to we just have one more question, Chiamaka, because we're, running, we're running, running short of time. There's been so many questions for you. We'll try, if we don't get time to answer these during this session, um, viewers, we will uh, submit these questions to the panelists and, and answer in a, in a later blog post. Um, so, okay, I have a question here. How do you engage with uh, non-learners, non-learner like uh, rural farmers. I guess this refers to, I'm not sure, like a, a lit literacy levels perhaps. Um, and then also just um, one also talks about the access to technology um, uh, and how that might vary from place to place. Um, and uh, hang on here. So, uh, wait, sorry, just a <laughs> so, um, yeah, so how do, you, how do you deal with those kinds of challenges of having, like, not, not, not having access to technology, computers, and, and, and the like? How do you deal with those kinds of challenges? Thank you very much. So first off, um, when, when we are dealing with rural women who are obviously not educated, we, we, we try to get down to their level. We, we try to speak in their dialect because that is a key of the first key to communicate with them. We speak in their dialect. But surprisingly, most of them know how to read. Because at a point when we carried out a project, we shared out uh, materials uh, to, to some of them. And those who didn't get the materials screamed and they were angry. They asked us, why didn't we give them materials that they can read as well? So, so most of these women can actually read. But what we try to do is to translate uh, the, uh, the communication material to their dialect so that they can easily understand what we are saying. We need to break it down to them. Um, so like I mentioned earlier when I was answering the John's, let me, when I was answering John's question, um, for women in rural communities who do not have 
access to digital tools, who cannot use it, obviously. Uh, what we do is we attach an agro -hype agent to them who goes there weekly to help them collect the data they've gotten over the week from the agribusinesses, from their farms. And from there, it's translated. And whatever translation we get, we also share with them. So if, the, if, they are not, if their um, soil is not rich enough from what we've discovered, we tell them, your soil is not good. You need to work on it. You need to, uh, you need to improve on the quality of soil. And we help them have access to um, the, the, the inputs to use for improving their soils. And for those that their beds are sick and they do not know, or for those that their eggs are dropping from the record we get, we also tell them, oh, this is what you should do. This is how you should do it from the information we've gotten. So we just take the information, we analyze it, and we translate it for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chimaka. Um, we're going to um, welcome our next speaker now, Susan Matthew. Um, so uh, Susan Matthew, she's an international trade analyst with over a decade of experience in agricultural trade and regional uh, value chains. Um, she has served at multiple policy and implementation positions in South Asia from diplomatic missions, national and state governments, and grassroots research organizations. So she's calling in now from uh, the state of Carol um, Kerala, <laughs> and she's going to talk a bit more about um, some of the uh, big data solutions by the government there. Thank you so much, Susan. You're welcome to take the floor. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. Um, this is indeed quite helpful because I come after two impressive presentations. So uh, this quite, quite helps me to put forward how small governments can also uh, uptake many of these inputs that um, you know institutions as well as technologies are providing. Um, let me just share the screen so that you can. There you go. All right. So, uh, so Kerala is a very small small coastal state uh, in the country of India. It's not so impressive by geography or by economy. What it is known for is, you know, having been a historical uh, spice trade route and it has had a cultural and religious reforms which has been influenced by multiple um, foreign uh, traders and its own domestic policies have been pretty matrilineal society uh, focused so that the land divisions and all such social reforms are pretty equitable. Uh, it has also topped the Indian state index for SDGs because it has low poverty. It, it is probably one of the few states in India which has more number of females as compared to males, which is 184, 1,084 females per 1,000 males. And it also has a high literacy rate because of all the social reforms that, that have taken place over the years. It is known for its superior healthcare reforms, high remittances, which come in due to its largely expat population. So 10% of the population in Kerala is pretty much expat. It, so a lot of remittances do come in. And the economy is primarily, you know, governed over the years, it has been governed by a coalition of communist, Marxist, and left-wing elected governments. Uh, which has led to a lot of socialist reforms. So, you know, benefiting everyone, both the rich and the poor, that kind of reforms. Uh, interestingly, the largest export from Kerala is this human resource, which is the healthcare professionals. Uh, agriculturally, it is quite well known for its high value niche, marine plantation, spice and forest products. And it's a beautiful state. If any of you could ever travel to it, please do come. It's very seasonal uh, tourism, but the income really helps the local people. Now, on 24th March, when the central government of India declared the lockdown in India, a lot of the states weren't really prepared to implement the lockdown. When the lockdown was uh, announced, it was a total lockdown in virtual as well as literal sense. Every, all shops closed down, or many government facilities closed down. And so this sort of imposed as well as sort of projected a lot of gaps that were there in uh, Kerala's infrastructure. So for example, Kerala is aging faster than rest of India. So a lot of its population cannot literally go out and buy commodities for their daily use. 
and a lot of the local young population has moved outside India or moved outside uh, Kerala. And so they are increasingly being replaced by the workforce that comes in from uh, West and, you know, as well as Northeast India. And the state, because of its small size and because of its demographic um, distribution, it highly depends on its neighboring states for vegetables, fruits, and even milk. So these, these sort of factors came, became highlighted during the COVID-19 national uh, lockdown. So how did, uh, so what I'm trying to go ahead and share is how did a small government like Kerala was able to go ahead and make sure that there was food security, both by making sure that the farmers in its state were being benefited by their reforms, as well as you know helping the aging population the domestic population as well as the migrant population get the food security that they needed so first thing and this initiative that kela was trying to do was already in progress for some time covid-19 just fast forwarded this initiative which was the state online fish auction like i said before kela is a coastal state a lot of its exports is marine and uh, fisheries uh, related. So during COVID-19, the state level Department of Fisheries was able to implement a virtual auction system for daily catch. So the wholesale buyers were able to bid for the daily catch through the virtual system. And they necessarily didn't have to deal with the middleman. And usually it's the middleman who sort of um, risk raising the prices of the uh, daily catch. And so this was a trial basis around 50 markets in Kerala were able to do this virtual auction system. Uh, but you know, the initiative has been proposed all over the country. So they are planning to build it up on a larger scale. Uh, but interestingly, small scale fish sellers, and I'm talking about fish sellers who go to each household and sell, who, whose uh, livelihoods were really impacted by the national lockdown, they were still preferring to do physical market auction systems. So it was more the export market oriented wholesale buyers. They were the ones who were really satisfied with the virtual auction system. And again, so the data that was being used for the online fish auction was collected by the Department of Fisheries through its various local uh, government offices. And the quality, the assaying, all of these criteria were um, done by the Department of Fisheries. So this helped so, to sort of set up a database which was used as the reference point for not only Kerala, but eventually in the coming days, many other states will be using that as a data point. Another uh, sort of big data reform that Kerala government used during COVID-19 lockdown, and this is what was more impressive, was using the public distribution system, which is a famed India is a big country, the, the, its population, majority of its population depends on the public distribution system for its day-to-day uh, -day, uh, requirement. And so Kela was able to set up community kitchens overnight at the village level. So I think on 24th March, the lockdown was announced. By 6th April, there were specialized subsidized COVID food kits for all types of ration card holders, not just uh, below the poverty line, above the poverty line, in between, but you know, everyone in the state, including the guest workers. So in Kerala, because Kerala has an expat population, they are sensitive to using the word um, migrant labors. So they came out with a law which said we wouldn't refer to them as migrant labors. We will call them as guest workers because they are coming to our state as guests and working for us. So that sort of helped, you know, take away the taboo of feeding uh, the population which was not citizens of that state. And again, the data that they were able to use and capture where each of these uh, guest worker camps were located, that was from the local labor department. And so there they were able to collate these data sets and they were able to use it to locate who are the needy, who would need these food kits. And be mindful that these my, uh, guest workers and the migrant 
uh, workers in Kerala uh, didn't have the ration card for Kerala. So they technically couldn't go to a you know government shop and get the uh, the facilities that the government would otherwise provide. So even without ration card, uh, Kerala government was able to do that. A more substantial input, and of course, you can see in the next slide the kind of um, items that Kerala government was handing out. Um, the state agency for horticulture called Horticop was able to procure horticulture produced from farmers at the gate farm gate level because due to the lockdown not a lot of them could move around uh, movement around the cities and the villages was restricted so state agency horticorp was able to take their little minivans go to the farms collect the produce and immediately distribute it in the vicinity so that also ensured that the households even though go the government was uh, providing cereals grains and you know all the um, mandatory household items but for fruits and vegetables they had another outlet which was the horticop outlet where they could uh, procure it another important aspect of the successful implementation of the public distribution system in Kerala was that during the national lockdown the schools were shut down and midday meals in schools the warm midday meals uh, that were provided in schools are a big help to a lot of the families in Kerala. So when the lockdown was announced, students had to stay back at home. They weren't able to move there. And the interesting part about this was school government officials were literally going to their students' houses to deliver these uh, ration kits as well as uh, midday meal raw materials for them to uh, process as well as use within their households. And so this was again, the, all of this was possible because Kerala is geographically quite small. So uh, uh, one school, even in the vicinity of two or three kilometers, it was feasible for the officials to travel and hand it over to uh, the houses. Another very interesting, and right now what is going on is a lot of the expat populations in Kerala had to come back because of COVID lockdown restrictions around the world. And so how do you ensure, ensure that this group of population, which had never benefited from the government uh, public distribution system, is suddenly uh, being asked to benefit? So they would have to provide extra for the expats who are returning. And so again, for that, they had to set up an Orca platform where they had a record of who's returning, when, which village, and they were able to allot their agriculture commodities as well as household goods according to that and so if you so this is more or less what a food kit would comprise so everything in in Malayalam we have a saying you know everything from soap to tea you could get in that food kit and this was a major help for families especially like I mentioned because a lot of them were aging they couldn't physically go out and purchase this during the lockdown. And in the other picture, you can see the, the, the range of commodities that was being provided by the government. Yeah, uh, and finally, another very, so this is not specific to COVID-19, but it sort of happened around COVID-19 because the focus was so much on how internationally weather is changing there are some things which are beyond our control and we need to be able to be better predict these systems and that was for along with the indian meteorological department uh, inputs kerala government decided that it needed private weather forecasting services to come in and help them predict better decisions both for monsoon for agriculture as well as for fishing and of course, natural calamities. And so SkyMet, which is an Indian company, Earth Networks and IBM, which are American companies. So Kerala government is going to use their services to enable better um, predictions, of course, to improve the extreme weather alert services. And so these three at the state, national and international level are pretty much what has been, um, we could say as flagship reforms uh, that could that we're helping Kerala government. Um, I think, so when we talk about other states in India and what specifically, why this has worked for Kerala is because first and foremost, there was trust in governance. A lot of the issues that we 
hear right about big data is do we trust that government or that institution to hold that data about us and so this was where the government had to show that this was not just a uh, temporary solution. This was a long-term solution in previous governments as well as in previous political uh, attention, you know, whatever uh, spans they have been given. They have been using this data both at the for the civil supplies, for the migrant labor, you know, all of these data was considered as trustworthy. And then the second, and I feel like at an individual, this was the more bigger important thing, which is that citizens agree to cooperate with the government. Citizens always have the option of um, not agreeing. They have the option of stepping away from these reforms, but they agree to cooperate with the government because they could see the, uh, the impact immediately. And of course, the final and bigger reason is um, Kerala could do this because it had already previous experience and infrastructure reforms that it had implemented earlier during two instances uh, from 2018 when it had the Nipah virus uh, uh, pandemic. It wasn't a pandemic, but it was a localized outbreak. So at that time also Kerala was able to use these systems and try them out as well as in 2018 it was affected by a massive flood. So even during that time Kerala was able to use a lot of these reforms. So pretty much it retrofitted all of these reforms to the COVID-19 scenario. Yeah, that's it. Marianne. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan. I have a few questions from the audience for you here. Um, so uh, Kyle. Uh, Kyle asks, compared to other Indian states, how was Kerala uh, successful in collecting big data for better policy decisions? So I think like these three factors that I mentioned, th this was pretty much what was helping uh, Kerala to make a substantial, you know, so people were trust trusting of the governance. And so go the government had a plan it implemented it partially during previous, uh, you know, during the Nipah virus as well as the flood uh, issue. And so, you know, the government was sure that this is going to work during COVID-19. So it was able to use those big data reforms in that sense. Uh, and so that really, you know, helped the government. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go for one more and then I'm going to open it up to uh, another full discussion. We're, we're a little bit out of time here. Um, so, uh, what are the services provided by weather by what are the services provided by private weather consultants and how do they generate income when such information is usually provided by government that's that's a very interesting question because kerala like i mentioned kerala kerala is not a big state it doesn't have a lot of state revenue to invest in uh, you know privatized weather consultants but one learning that kerala had was from the previous flood as well as you know fishing season um, issues is that they had to spend money in order to ensure that these things wouldn't happen again and so that is why they were able to hire these private uh, weather co companies and I forgot what was the second part of the question uh... Hang on one moment. I've just popped it into the answered side. So I just have to pull it up again. Uh, one moment. Uh, yeah. So how do they generate income when such information is usually provided by government? Yeah. So there is definitely, you know, the state revenue as well as the central government has a substantial revenue uh, specifically for this, the, the partnership with these three companies, they have had some uh, input, uh, not only in terms of revenue, but also in terms of knowledge from the World Bank. And so these are the various avenues where they're able to get these, uh, yeah, revenue. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to go into answering a couple of these other questions. Um, if not, uh, after Berber's presentation, we'll, we'll try to answer them after the, this session. So we're going to hand it over to, to Berber now. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Barbara Kramer, she's a research fellow with the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, as it's uh, most widely known. Um, her research uh, focuses on financial inclusion and resilience, and in particular on innovations in agricultural insurance and seed systems that can help smallholder farmers adapt to ch climate change. 
She leads a research program that aims to strengthen agricultural insurance and finance in Ethiopia, India, and Kenya through picture-based crop insurance using smartphone images of targeted crops to monitor crop health and management. So she's, um, this project is actually one of the Big Data Platform's Inspire Challenge projects. Um, and she's also a recent winner of our Inspire Challenge Rapid Response Grant um, for a project that seeks to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is super interesting. Uh, I'm very excited to hear all about it. Um, so Kramer, if you, if you want to take it away. Uh, Berber, sorry. <laughs> I'll take it away. Thank you so much, Mara. No worries. Um, so yeah, in the interest of time, <coughs> sorry. Sorry, um, in the interest of time, let me just jump right into what we're working on. Um, so this is a partnership between IFPRI and Dwara e-registry of social enterprise um, in India. Um, and the project is around bringing eyes on the ground for agriculture microcredit. So I wanna start with um, some background an article from The Economist that came out about two months ago, um, which was making the case that um, although there has been a lot of tremendous progress in financial inclusion and increasing access to finance for the world's most poorest. With the COVID pandemic, a lot of this progress is kind of rolled back and microfinance is drying up because the banks need to repay, the microfinance institutions need to repay the banks to whom they are, uh, um, uh, from whom they are lending. Um, but it has been difficult to collect money from farmers in the middle of a lockdown. Um, another issue in microfinance in a world with COVID-19 and, and lockdowns, physical distancing guidelines, is that microfinance traditionally relies on face-to-face -face group meetings. Um, and this high-touch model with group meetings is important in the context of microfinance because um, borrowers typically don't have collateral um, and documented land rights, for instance, to put down when applying for a loan. And so in a way, the group becomes the collateral and the group helps in a way the microfinance institution monitor whether loans are used wisely and also screen their peers for whether they are good borrowers before making um, loans. So, so in this context, it becomes a question, okay, can we revise this model? Um, are there solutions? And that's where our Inspire Challenge project came in, because what we're working on is developing tools that help different actors in the agricultural value chain to monitor crops remotely. And that provides a mechanism to monitor potentially microcredit loans um, for agriculture remotely. So that's what we mean with bringing eyes on the ground. Um, so a little bit of background around the Inspire Challenge project. Um, a couple of years ago, um, IFPRI and other partners in India started developing a concept called picture-based insurance, um, uh, also called Seeing is Believing, in which we were using smartphone camera pictures um, to provide insurance for visible damage in crops, um, and also agriculture advisories to make um, advisories more relevant and targeted to farmers based on smartphone images. Um, here's how it, how it works. Um, farmers download a smartphone app on their phones. They send an initial image of their plots and throughout the season, they take follow-up images of that same site um, so that people monitoring these crops remotely can actually monitor the crops throughout the season. Um, then the images are being interpreted by people with an agriculture uh, background, um, scientists, um, experts, and finally, on the basis of that, crop advisories and insurance payouts are being issued. So that's how we started this journey. Um, and that's what became the Seeing is Believing project at the Inspire Challenge um, that has won an Inspire Challenge award. Now, as we were um, looking at the impact of COVID, we realized, okay, maybe the, the picture-based crop monitoring is also a solution to help microfinance lenders get their eyes on the ground and to provide credit and address these challenges around monitoring um, problems that instead of relying on 
peers uh, on group members having to monitor each other and having this high touch model with group meetings that instead a lot of this can be solved by technology and that by getting the using the technology to to kind of get out there without having to be there physically in person um, so with um, an organization, as I mentioned, Vara e-registry, a social enterprise, they're based in Hyderabad, and we are working with them in Odisha, a state in eastern India. Um, with them, we um, developed the solution to provide credit, um, uh, and we're partnering with a microfinance institution in Odisha um, to get this going. Um, basically, the idea is um, to not only use smartphone pictures, but what's really nice is that as we were working on our Inspire Challenge um, program, um, we got in touch with Zwara e-registry, which was separately developing different uh, models and using satellite remote sensing and other sources of data to develop a model to predict yield potential at the plot level um, and thereby also make a link with credit worthiness for farmers. Um, this model um, became what they call CAT score. Um, or in, it's, it's, a, it's a type of um, score that indicates what a plot level yield potential is. And it's using different pieces of information, um, both satellite imagery on the current season, but also vegetation indices and predicted yields um, from, from the past using the satellite imagery or the history of building a production history using satellite imagery um, going back in time for that plot. Um, then also satellite imagery is being used to estimate acreage. Here is a link with the smartphone pictures because the smartphone pictures are geo-referenced. And so this tells us the location of the plot and that allows then linking with the satellite imagery. Um, so this is a larger model that then builds in the smartphone images um, in a practical and pragmatic way um, to say something about one, the credit worthiness of a farmer at the start of the season, but also during the season to monitor whether crops are developing appropriately, adequately to issue additional tranches of loans. Um, and so in the current um, monsoon season, we are working with a microfinance lender called Vector Finance. Um, of providing farmers with this digital agricultural uh, microcredit solution using remote monitoring using that CAT score uh, model. Um, and it's, it's really an, an exciting partnership um, that I'm looking forward to because our goal is to continue reaching farmers at low cost but with more targeted products. So instead of a general microfinance loan, a loan that is really targeted at agriculture and helping farmers increase their investments in agriculture, which is critical in this period of, of lockdowns and physical uh, distancing. Um, so as I mentioned, we're working with Vara e-registry, with Vector Finance to issue the loans. And then IFRI um, uh, is in this case, not so much focused on the technology development um, because that's something that, that Vara e-registry is, is specialized in. Um, but instead, we will take the lead in the um, gender and the M&E components. And if there's questions about that, I can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, let me skip to my last slide. Thank you so much. And in case you have any questions, also feel free to reach out over email. Uh, thank you so much, Berber. Um, look, while we wait for some of these questions to come in, I definitely have, have some. Uh, a comment first as well, because, um, because Chiamaka also mentioned this about how the training is so important, um, uh, especially when you're talking about bridging that gender gap. Um, and I know that your project, you do have a component to be training uh, women in, in, these, in these skills, is that, that, that's correct? Um, yeah. So I wanted to hear just a little bit more about some of these gender norms that might prevent women from benefiting and um, you know, this, uh, benefiting from these agricultural technology enabled micro, micro edit products and, and what, uh, what your, you and your team are doing to, to combat those. To address them? <clears throat> That's a very important question. Um, so the microfinance um, lender, as they are issuing new loans, they always provide trainings um, to their, so, so their, the, the, the vast majority of their lenders are actually women. And they often, they always provide a training. Now the loans that they normally provide are general microfinance loans. And there are these norms um, 
that are very discouraging for women to enter agriculture or for women to take out loans that are specifically designed for agriculture. Um, there's really strong norms that say, okay, agriculture is a, a male business in a way. Um, and so what we are going to do as part of the trainings with the microfinance institution through aspirational videos, also the husbands are going to come to these trainings. Um, there will be a lot of emphasis on um, yeah, using videos and other training materials, exercises to at least try and do something about these norms, at least try and create awareness of the norms that they are there and that maybe the first reaction of people might be, oh, this loan for agriculture, this is not meant for me because agriculture is a male business, but that as we create awareness of those norms, um, that it might create discussion that it becomes more acceptable for women to take on these loans um, and to have access to finance for their agriculture because women are involved in agriculture. We all know that. Of course. Um, I have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, they ask, are there concerns about equity in this program for farmers uh, without access to smartphones or do all farmers have smartphones in these contexts? So I, yeah, great question. Um, a lot of farmers won't have smartphones, so as part of the product training, um, so successful farmers who, who apply, who are granted the loans, um, it will come in this initial stage with a smartphone uh, from, the pro from the project um, that can be shared among people who live close to one another um, and with a training on how to use the smartphone, because that's definitely a barrier that needs to over be overcome. So I guess this is also uh, you're you're talking about the use of of like extension type workers um, or an extension type network, uh, similar to what Shimaka was 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 discussing. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, look, I think this is just such uh, an excellent um, example of um, different projects or initiatives that. Are agile to agile enough to respond to this kinds of global pandemics. I mean, you've been running this, uh, you know, separate uh, Inspire Challenge project for a couple of years now, and this is just a, a fantastic example of of a pivot that that works well to to address like new new upcoming um, problems. Uh, have you? Are there any other areas where you think something uh, like this could be a, a useful solution? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would like to leave this to the market um, to say, you know, if we see if, if, uh, if there is a need, um, for instance, with VARA uh, e-registry, they came to us, they said, oh, actually, you know, we see this as a solution in, in this context. Um, I wouldn't want to be pushing for a picture-based crop monitoring solution. Um, uh, from our end. I think it needs to be demand driven. People say, oh, we need to have eyes on the ground uh, and we would like to find ways to have eyes on the ground, then please do reach out to me. Thank you so much, Berber. Um, I'm going to put a couple of questions back to the panel that were not answered before just for the next brief few minutes and then we're going to, to end the call. We were just a, a bit over time already as it is. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm just going to bring them up because there was quite a few. <laughs> uh, so we have here, um, okay. All right. One question to Susan. Um, how would you compare, uh, Kerala's preparedness before the pandemic versus their response after March? So in your opinion, what are the key lessons that can be adapted to other smaller states? And how much does Kerala's literacy rate play into that? I know it's a very long question, but do your best. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the primary um, understanding that we have to have about the Kerala government reforms is they had already done a version of this in previous uh, virus outbreak as well as the flood relief work. So they were kind of prepared to be overwhelmed by the amount of need that it's citizens would have. Uh, so they were prepared for this, 
before March, as well as when the national government announced the lockdown, but they weren't 100% prepared. And that is why after March right now, uh, so for example, today Kerala has recorded the largest number of COVID cases ever in its state in the single day hike. And so that has become an issue where even if they provide food, even if they provide medical services, there are certain things that government reforms would stop it. And it's the citizen's responsibility to take up, right? And in these cases, this is where Kerala sets the bar for other states, not only smaller, but larger states. Kerala is a very small state, but it has a huge network of primary health centers, as well as primary ration shops where the government provides its uh, household goods to its citizens. Uh, so I would say number one, just expand the infrastructure for the state government. What it enables is the states to capture that. And so even if, for example, in Kerala right now, you can see after March, the cases have gone up, but people are not exactly restricted uh, because of these uh, lockdown restrictions. They are able to move around, they are able to sort of uh, ensure that their produce is reaching markets. They are able to make sure that the processed food grains are able to uh, reach kitchens. And so these are some learnings that definitely states can, uh, state governments can implement. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Susan. I have one last question uh, that I'll put to Berber and then um, we're going to, to end the call. Um, to Berber from Kiruba, uh, they ask, how is data management and long-term data storage aspects handled with equity? Thanks for that question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if this has to do with people providing their data and making sure that they get something in return um, for that data. That, um, and that is very much the, the underlying concept here, the motivation, is that we currently see a lack of access to agricultural credit um, for some of the world's most poorest. Um, for small marginal farmers who do not have documented land rights, who would not be able to go to a bank and ask for an, a typical crop loan. Um, so in that regard, the data is really collected and stored with the aim of um, improving services for people who need those services, um, we think the most. Um, we are going to evaluate this. Um, there is a randomized trial built into the, into the project to uh, monitor and evaluate the impacts. Um, and as part of that also, we will be very carefully creating the data. And the data at the end of the randomized trial um, will be uh, anonymized, of course, um, but will be made um, av available also for other um, users um, to, to take advantage of. Now, of course, all anonymized um, because we wouldn't want to jeopardize the confidentiality of the study participants. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Berber. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists and, and our audience members who joined us today. Um, I just wanted to finish with also with one little reminder. We have our uh, annual convention coming up, which this year will be fully online, accessible and free for anybody who w wishes to join. I'm going to pop a link in the chat here so um, you can register at any time. Um, and, and yeah, I just want to thank everybody. Um, thank you for your questions. We will uh, be posting this video um, a little later. Just going to post this link here for the convention and, and that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye everyone.